Let's open up our Bibles together this morning. Turn our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Those of you who've been paying attention and realize that I'm going off of Hebrews this Sunday. We're not in Hebrews today. So we have application to the new covenant of Hebrews and the blood shed there by Jesus Christ. So our topic today, today's topic is what was in the cup at the Lord's table. As a church body, we are gradually in the process of a reformation and restoring the symbol of wine to the Lord's table as the Bible prescribes. I don't know how many Sundays uh, I taught Sunday school on this topic, but I know I had 30 pages of notes that we went through, I think over something like 14 or so weeks. Those are available to anyone who wants the full load plus the addendum, which is for extra pages, free of charge. This morning, I wanted to bring the entire congregation along on this because it is necessary not just to do it in Sunday school, but in the church as well and prepare us for what we are doing as a body. And so this, this morning is going to center on the Lord's table, his teaching. So I bring you to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I ask you to follow along as I begin reading, as I so often repeat every time we celebrate the Lord's table, these words. Chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Would you bow in prayer with me this morning? Our Father, we give you thanks this morning for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And, O oh Lord Jesus, we thank you for your willingness, for your desire to be our substitutionary atonement, to pay with your blood and to take on yourself the very wrath of God against sin on our behalf. Praise be unto thy name. And in so doing, you instituted the new covenant under which we place our faith, our faith in you. Help us, Lord, to observe your table as we ought. Bring us together in unity according to your will that is written so clearly in your word. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Traditions. 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 We have them in many facets of our lives. We have social traditions. We have family traditions. We have holiday traditions. Even in the church, we have traditions, the way we do things. Some of them are biblical. Some of them are not. Those two need to be distinguished one from another as two different levels of importance. What are God's traditions that he has given us that we must enjoy and obey? We're in a day when the word conservative is used often. 
Many like to identify as conservatives, and I would identify myself as such. I identify myself as a United States citizen, as a conservative. With regard to the Constitution, I'm an originalist, and I believe we conserve the original intent of the Constitution as written by the founders, word for word. Conserving that's important. It is, however, secondary to my conservative stance as an evangelical Christian, as a pastor. As a pastor and a conservative, I'm here to conserve the very word of God as he gave it and as he wrote it originally. So I'm a traditionalist. I'm an originalist. And I believe we should take it word for word in its context. If you still have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 11, let's remind ourselves of the context that Paul is speaking into in the church at Corinth. Paul calls on these divisive church members to unify, and to unify under Jesus Christ even in their taking of the Lord's table. In chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says this, Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. So as he imitates Christ, imitate him. Verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and listen, and keep the traditions as I deliver them to you. Now, just for your reference, verse 1 and 2 come before verses 23 through 27 that we just read. Making the Lord's table observance a tradition to be observed as Paul delivered them. These traditions can also be defined as ordinances, depending on your translation of the Greek. And they really come from a Hebrew background, which means the traditional laws handed down from God. Now, sometimes there's a need for reformation. Conservatives have to have as part of their focus finding those things that are not traditional or that have been done away with and are no longer traditionally observed and restoring them via reformation. Martin Luther was a reformer of many great problems in the church of his day. But he wasn't the first reformer. There was a reformer by the name of King Hezekiah, king of Judah. In 2 Chronicles, we read that the Passover observance, which was a tradition, a law of tradition, commanded by God, had been lost. How it became lost is somewhat a mystery to us, not in total as we read our Bible, for the culture and the traditions of the nations around Israel gradually encroached into Judah and replaced God's given traditions and Passover gradually went by the wayside. But King Hezekiah found out that they should have been keeping it and weren't and went about reforming to conserve that tradition and bring it back into practice in the way in which it should be done. Had he not done that, and Passover was not being observed in Judah, then when Jesus Christ came riding on the colt of a donkey and setting up a Passover supper after his triumphal entry, no one in Judah would have known what to do. But he told his disciples, go ahead and prepare, prepare the Passover, prepare it for me. I will eat this Passover with you. I have wanted to do it for a very long time. 
Passover is always remembered throughout the Bible as God's great deliverance of Israel from the bondage of physical slavery in Egypt. Jesus Christ, when he takes the cup, and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, he is at a Passover observance with his disciples. And the cup that he takes is known as the third cup of the Passover Seder. It's called the cup of redemption. Just as God bought his people back out of slavery in Egypt, Jesus Christ, in the spiritual sense, by shedding his physical blood, brings all man, including Israel, from the slavery of sin and the consequences of the wrath of God, and he instituted the Lord's table from the very fabric of the Passover observance. Thank God for Hezekiah, who restored the Passover observance. God has made us in a certain way as men. He's given us the desire to know. We want to know. We want to know things, don't we? We want to find out truth. We have an instinctive nature that wants to know truth from error and right from wrong. God has also given us the ability to reason, and therefore he speaks to man and says, Come, let us reason together. And this morning, that is exactly what I intend to do, is to reason with you as we reason with God. To find out truth logically and separate it from error. We all know what I'm talking about. Wine. Alcohol. And this is a Baptist church. The old tradition would be to rail against any use of alcohol or wine in any form. But I ask you, where did that come from? Is that a biblical tradition or one made by man that came in from outside biblical truth? You're all reasonable people. Many of you have been raised in the church and you've read your Bibles. And many of you young people have found this yourself. Many Christians saying you should never ever drink alcohol, you should never drink wine, and that we only use grape juice in the observance of the Lord's table. Am I right or wrong? Yet you read your Bible and reasonably you ask this question, if wine is so bad, why did Jesus change water into wine at the wedding of Cana. Why? Our reasoning finds that there's some sort of disconnect between the two programs. One says, never, ever, not at all. And then we read of Jesus changing water into wine and people drinking it. So is he a participant in sin? Is Jesus in error? or vice versa. That's what we're here to discover. And I know that this may be difficult to us because sometimes these are foundational things and things that many of us have held on to as a sign of whether or not we're walking with the Lord. And oftentimes we do things like that to us. We take a law that's been written by men and adopted by men and called righteousness and then we think by doing that, of observing that, we're somehow pleasing God. When in fact, that's not the, the case at all. We're pleasing ourselves and men. And we've just added to God's word, which as I read the end of Revelation is a wee bit dangerous. And I say that sort of tongue in cheek. So we read these things, we reason them out, and we wonder what was in the Passover cup that Jesus Christ was using at the Passover. Well, 
This morning, brothers and sisters, Scripture presents wine as the appropriate symbol to represent the blood of Jesus Christ in keeping the Lord's table ordinance. It is the appropriate symbol. It is the biblical symbol. And this morning as well, history shows us how churches in America were led by cultural pressures to use grape juice instead of wine and adopt a law prohibiting its use, which is contrary to the Bible. I have much to say, and this may at times sound like a classroom more than, than a pulpit, but don't worry, I'm sure I'll get preachy time to time. I take us to our first point in your notes, history speaks. History speaks. It has been said, he who fails to learn from history is doomed to what? To repeat it. So if we do not learn from history, we are then going to repeat it. Hezekiah and Israel lost the Passover. And we say, how could that possibly happen? Well, very easily. You quit paying attention to the Word. The Word of God. We have 1,800 plus years of church history where wine is the only symbol used for what was in the cup at the Lord's table. Every time they observe communion, or even some as they call it the Eucharist, it was wine in the cup. Tracing all the way back to the institution of Jesus Christ in the upper room. But I want to give you some of those 1,800 years of testimony. What did the early church do? Sometimes you just want to, okay, let's just do it like they did it when they started. And that's why Paul says to the Corinthians, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. And then he says, this is what he did. And he instituted these things. Church pastors testify, I'd bring you to Justin Martyr. He wasn't always called Justin Martyr. They actually called him that after he died. And he died at the hands or underneath the authority of that great Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius. If you're a fan of the movie Gladiator, he's the old emperor that's dying that is portrayed there. This Justin lived at that time under Roman rule. He writes an apologetic, meaning a defense of the church. In that day, Christians were looked at, and oftentimes a falsehood was told about the church. They said they are actually pagans drinking blood in church. That's part of their pagan rituals. And the Romans detested that. Justin writes to clarify that, no, they are not drinking blood. They are drinking wine as a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed. And he writes an entire passage about this called the, the Administrations of the Sacraments. It's a longer quote, but I need to read it because I find it lovely. So this man lived and born in 114 A.D., and he died in 165 A.D., early church. What were they doing? This. But we, Justin says, Justin Martyr says, after we have thus washed him, who has been convinced and has attested to our teaching, bring him to the place where those who are called brethren are assembled, in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for the baptized, illuminated person, and for all others in every place, that we may be counted worthy now that we have learned the truth, by our works also be found good citizens and keepers of the commandments, so that we may be saved with an everlasting salvation. Having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss. <laughs> oh, sorry. 
The laugh wasn't in there. It's just what they did. We salute one another with a kiss. There is then brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. And he taking them gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands. And when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all the people present express their assent by saying, Amen. And he goes on to say, When the president has given thanks to and all the people have expressed their assent, those who are called by us deacons give to each of those present to partake of the bread and the wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving was pronounced, and to those who are absent, they carry away a portion. So even if they're not there, they take the bread and wine to them, and they observe the Lord's table. I move along just a little bit in history, but to a whole different area, away from the West and Rome and across the Mediterranean to Alexandria. And this comes from Clement of Alexandria, whose birth date is in doubt, either 153 to somewhere between 153 and 193 A.D. We do know he died in 217 A.D., very beginning of the 3rd century. He writes a complete chapter, I love this, in his, in his writing in his work called uh, the instructor, or as you would call it in the Greek, pedagogus, from which we get pedagogy, in which he's teaching, he's teaching and giving instruction on Christian morals and manners, and the chapter is called On Drinking. He doesn't just handle the Lord's table, he handles all aspects of it, but this is going to give you just the proof of what they used at the Lord's table and why, and how to handle wine in balance. He says, and I quote, Clement, Clement of Alexandria, the scripture accordingly has named wine the symbol of the sacred blood, but the base tippling with the dregs of wine, it says, Intemperate is wine, and insolent is drunkenness. There is moderation. The symbol used at the Lord's table by the scriptures, moderation in the use of wine, all in a simple sentence. Brilliant. I take you now to Cyprian, who was born in 200 A.D. and died in 258 A.D. He now pastor of Antioch. Antioch, yes, you know the one where Christians were first called Christians in Antioch, Asia Minor. So we've gone from west, south to Africa, and now to Asia Minor. What were they doing? I quote Cyprian. In Antioch, where the disciples were first called Christians, now he says, but how perverse and how contrary is it that although the Lord at the marriage made wine of water, we should make water of wine. Why did he say this? He said this, and I wish I could have brought more of this to show you, but the Jews were using only water at the Lord's table. And he has written this as a corrective and admonishment away from using water as the symbol of the blood of Christ and emphasizing that wine should be used. So there's an error he's trying to fix. So now he's saying, and I read again, but how perverse and how contrary it is that although the Lord at the marriage made wine of water, we should make water of wine when even the sacrament of that thing ought to admonish and instruct us rather to offer wine in the sacrifices of the Lord. 
What were they doing then? What is the years of history? They were using wine in the early church to celebrate and to observe in obedience the Lord's table. Now in your bulletin, I put it there since I do not have time for it here, a reference to a pastor in Scotland called Alexander McLaren, very famous, who started in the 1900s his life and ended them in the early 20th century, he mentions wine as the symbol for the Lord's table. So what we have historically is from the start of the church by Jesus Christ himself, the practice of the church for all of these centuries, up until a recent period of time, wine was used as the symbol for the Lord's table and the blood of Christ. When did the churches in the United States start using grape juice instead of wine and why? Isn't that a question you have? How did this happen? If that's the case, that all these churches were using this and Jesus used it, why did we stop? Well, I pose to you this logical answer. Culture won, and the Bible lost. The culture won, and the Bible lost. That's why churches gave up wine and started using grape juice from external cultural pressures. We understand those pressures today, don't we? Aren't there external cultural pressures trying to get us to do certain different things in the church than what the Bible teaches? This is no surprise that it could have happened before. Why is it that we only allow men in pulpits? Is it because we're misogynistic? Is it because we are patriarchal? We hate women? No, because the Bible expressly says that the pulpit is for men, and not for all men, only approved men, qualified men, attested men from the congregation. But there's women in pulpits now, and we know how that happened. Feminism, the erasure of the roles of men and women in the culture brought into the church and the adulteration of the church service. Well, this happened in our recent past as well. Feminists called by another, way, another name in their early establishment, feminism was called the rise of women's suffrage. You see, to be a woman, a woman, they were suffering because they were women. They were of a lesser category. And in truth, men did often treat them that way. But that's no reason to reverse the roles and no reason to change the Bible and no reason to change the Lord's table. However, that's exactly what happened. The rise of women's suffrage and also a movement called the temperance movement. Along with something that happened concurrently, the tent meeting evangelists. All of these rose up in the 1800s in the United States of America. In 1848, the women's suffrage movement began. Suffragists circulated petitions and lobbied Congress to pass constitutional, a constitutional amendment to enfranchise women, which meant to give them the right to vote. In 1920, so they fought from 1848 to 1920, the 19th Amendment was added to the Constitution. Enfranchising women was finally rat ratified this victory is considered the most significant achievement of women in the progressive era, hence feminism is born. All the way up till then, men represented their families at the ballot box. The wise men took advice, counsel from their wives as to how to vote, but the man, one man, voted for his entire family. 
Now we think it's ludicrous that that should be done. I'm not speaking about that today. I'm just throwing that little hand grenade over the wall and seeing what happens. Temperance. Temperance was a popular issue, a cultural issue, for the late 19th century, meaning the end of the 1800s. For the late 19th century, these reforming women Temperance reformers sought to limit the consumption of alcohol by Americans. They saw that there was a lot of abuse, and they sought to stop it, and even stop it by force. Listen. In December of 1873, in Ohio, New York, and other states, women staged a revolt against saloon owners. Several thousand saloons were temporarily shut down in 1874. The women's, hear me, the women's Christian temperance union was founded. So they illegally stopped business, refused the rights of freedom to saloon owners to force their agenda like good Christian women chaste, good keepers at home, trying to win their husbands even without a word, blockading saloons. How biblical? No. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was founded. One of the most colorful members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union was Carrie Nation who beginning in 1900, she traveled around Kansas smashing saloons with a hatchet. Is that what we should teach in church? I think not. That's not how we influence people. And that's not the use of the word and trusting in the power of the word. The Women's Christian Temperate Temperance Unit, Union, excuse me, was instrumental in paving the way for the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1919. So they got this done before the vote. The vote came second. 1919, prohibition was passed. The 19th, 18th Amendment prohibited the sale of alcohol nationwide. Now, at the same time, the tent meeting revivals were rising up. Remember, we'd been through a big civil war in the 1800s. And when it had ended, the nation was still in turmoil, and there was a lot of people divided still. And there was a, a rebellion going on as the nation tried to find itself. But even more so, there was a, a lack of men. The war had killed many, many men, believing and non-believing, but so was the loss of men in the country that pulpits were being emptied and no one was there to fill them because the men were dead. And they couldn't train up enough of them. And so pragmatism came in and the tent meaning with it. You ever heard the saying, well, we just need a warm body in the pulpit. Well, that's what they found. And they found men who had a certain ability, and they started putting them in pulpits. And they began with the tent meeting revivals. Interesting, they moved out of the church building. They moved into the countryside. They set up tents and tried to get everybody together. And in trying to get them a better, together, they started looking for, listen, moral issues to attract people while avoiding doctrine that might alienate prospective ticket buyers. To go to a tent meeting, you had to buy a ticket. And they wanted la di da -di everybody. So don't, don't teach the doctrines of the different denominations because they might not buy a ticket. Speak at moral issues like Temperance, not drinking alcohol. The Women's Christian Temperance Unit Union then found a male mouthpiece. They needed a male mouthpiece. They hadn't gotten into the pulpits yet. 
and they found their mouthpiece in a man called Billy Sunday, an ex-baseball player. Well, that trick's been tried. Get somebody famous, put them in the pulpit, see what happens without training. Well, Billy Sunday made revival into entertainment. Pulling an offering was developed by Billy Sunday, for he said, you must pay for entertainment. One writer says in writing about the ministry, if you can call it that, of Billy Sunday, he said, quote, reflected in his ministry is the essence of the American Christianity, where money is important, theology is not. And the writer goes on to say, without da doubt, God is an American. I think all of us could be a little guilty of that kind of a view, especially the one about God being an American. He's not. Sunday, Sunday's revivals, he goes on to say, became unabashedly dramatic unabashedly dramatic performances where audiences laugh at and cry over and are entertained by the histrionics of the master showman. One headline in 1904 read, Evangelist does great vaudeville stunts in tabernacle pulpit. Revival had become show business. In short, he goes on to say, The Sundays prayed for God's direction but allowed the culture, allowed their culture to dictate the road. The pressure of cultural movements moved into the churches. Doctrine was largely ignored. One writer said a scripture reference is read and ignored under the onslaught of stories and general moral admonitions. Along with this was, came the movement called anti-intellectualism. There was a rebellion against training men theologically and biblically and in the languages. And they said if a man has the ability, he should be allowed to speak. If the unction's upon him, we should let the unction go, whatever that was. And so Christians did not become more biblically knowledgeable. They became less so, which of course allows them to be manipulated far more easily. So Sunday began to give more of an emphasis in his campaigns to fighting certain social evils. The writer of one biography says he began to build his messages around temperance and patriotism. His famous booze sermon, Get on the Water Wagon, it was titled. See, get off the beer wagon, get on the water wagon. He preached this in every single city. President Woodrow Wilson declared Sunday to be a major force behind the war effort, his patriotism, and many suggested prohibition would never have passed without his help. So how did it happen that the mob took over the booze business? Feminism and ignorant preaching. But it was entertaining. Culture won, the Bible lost. In the churches, the Baptist capitulation to cultural pressures. The Baptist capitulation to cultural pressures, this is historical. This is our country. This is how it happened. It wasn't because they read the Bibles and found it to be true and so switched. It was from a cultural movement. Even in 1820, many evangelicals opposed the use of alcohol as a beverage due to its tragic social cons consequences. And that's fine. We just can't mandate it in the church because it's not in the Bible. In 1848, Baptist editor Joseph Baker recommends a change from wine to unfermented grape juice. And I quote, he acknowledged that the apostolic wine, quote, often, if not always, contained alcohol. And that therefore, listen to this, and that therefore there could be no justification for refusing alcoholic wine if served in communion. But, but he shows his stalwart strength, 
or I would rather suggest his spineless capitulation, when he says, but, he continued, it was best, quote, if our churches, when, practice, when practicable, should procure for sacramental purposes wine without any alcoholic mixture, hence the search for grape juice. Down in the Bible Belt, the Kentucky's Bracken Baptist Association recommended in 1860 that its churches purchase from vintners, quote, unfermented wine for sacramental purposes. Cultural pressure wins. The Bible in the Lord's table lost. In the 1900s, temperance was now expected of evangelical Christians and prohibition legislation was growing in popularity. Another historian says, by the early 20th century, Baptist churches in the North and South had widely adopted the use of unfermented wine or grape juice. By 1950, the use of fermented wine is regarded as very rare. This is how the feminists won and the Bible lost. So what has feminism gained, and do we really want to be influenced by their cultural causes? How did we get to where we are today? How are we going to let movements like Black Lives Matter enter our church? How are we going to get critical race theory? Are we going to take that and bring it into church since it's taught in the schools and in the nation at large? What will it change? What changes will it demand? What will we do with the cultural social pressure of the LGBTQ plus movement? Should we let that in? Everybody's doing it. I think when we understand that that's where the roots of removing wine from the Lord's table rest, not in the Bible, but in a social cultural movement I think we would say, how did we let that happen? But more so, are we going to continue so? Imagine it this way. Say they are living in our age. Say we've been using wine up till now. And imagine it this way. If the LGBTQ plus movement added, say, perhaps like some speaker in churches, say maybe somebody like Joel Osteen. I'm not saying he would. I'm just saying he's an entertainer. Say if he came and he started from his health and wealth pulpit to influence your church to stop using wine as part of the Lord's table observance so you'd help all of culture and society. Would you follow their lead? Most of you now are saying, no way! Well, that's, a, I think, a balanced comparable. So what do we do? Well, that's coming. But first, let me address this, legalism. So the Bible lost, culture won, and now legalism arrives at the Lord's table. A law made by men becomes the law inside the church that now dictates the way in which we observe our Lord's table, the Master's table, God's table. The birth of legalism at the Lord's table began with feminism and ignorant preaching. And a law was made. A law. Not a law from God, but a law from men. Alcohol is evil. You shouldn't drink it. See, legalism is this. It's a doctrine that salvation is gained through good works. But it's even more than that. It's adding to what God said and thinking you're pleasing him by, adding, by doing what you've added to God's word. Even sanctification, the process of growing in our grace and faith of the Lord in practice 
When we manufacture our own laws to keep and then keep them, we are not actually being spiritual. We are being legalistic. Especially when we tell others that that's what they should do. How many of us as children were told never to drink alcohol? It's evil. God doesn't want you to do that. And then you read your Bibles and you find Jesus drinking and making water into wine. You read your Old Testament and you find that even in the practices there, there's a drink offering poured out to the Lord. What do you do? You think. You don't just follow everybody else, you follow the Bible. So we might be the only church, but we're not. But we are reforming. Legalisms. You know, there's, there's this, this idea, right, that, that if we can stop people from doing things that will hurt them, if they, if they you just remove the alcohol, then nobody will be drunk. Then, then sin will stop. Then the men will return to their homes and take care of their families and not spend it down at the saloon. That's what the women were trying to do. And how did it work? They got alcohol anyway. The speakeasy was born. They hid it from the government. They got it cheaper. And some of them died from it because it was made poorly. It didn't stop sin. And the Bible attests that the laws that we make and try to foist them on the church do not help man. Listen. Biblical protection against the indulgence of the flesh is what we need. Legalisms are unnecessary. Legalisms are for pagans, not for Christians. Listen to Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourself to regulations, i.e. their regulations? Paul says, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. That means not God's, but their commandments. Verse 23, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. And listen, have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. Telling people in church never to drink alcohol and that wine shouldn't be part of the Lord's table is a man-imposed religion that isn't from Jesus. It is not. It is a legalism. Self-imposed religion, false humility, he goes on, neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. You know what's of value against the indulgence of the flesh? Conversion by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The old heart is taken out and the new heart is given and the word of God is written on the heart and can be lived. Self-control, a fruit of the spirit, can be had under his power. Amen or no? Here's the worst part about legalisms and man's invoked religion that aren't from Jesus. Legalisms accuse God of unrighteousness. Legalisms accuse God of unrighteousness and falsely raise men to righteousness. When we say what the Bible does not say, no wine, no alcohol, God says, we have just, one, put words into God's mouth, which is bad, but it's like saying it this way, and I wrote this down the other day. It's like saying God forgot to prohibit alcohol and so and wine so we will do it for him well you've just attacked the omniscience of god he's not smart enough doesn't know everything you've attacked the omnipotence of god that he's all powerful and you've not you've knocked the holiness of god you've just said we're more holy than he is we live better than jesus well, pride cometh before the fall. 
and all legalisms are pride. That's why Jesus hated the laws that the Pharisees brought to bear on the people of Israel because they were not from him. They were doing it with good intentions. We'll help them keep the law. We'll put laws in front of the laws so they can't even get close to breaking the law. And we're going to watch them like hawks. And aren't those wonderful people to be around? The Bible, however, teaches us this. It comes by way of a backhanded way of attacking Jesus. First, they said of John the Baptist that he came neither eating nor drinking. And they said he has a devil or a demon. And then in Matthew 11, verse 19, it says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. Are we wise? The wise do what God says and add no more and are comfortable in their faith. The unwise add to God's word and they attack God. Jesus drank wine or this would not have stuck as an accusation. Jesus couldn't please the unbelieving world. John the Baptist couldn't please the unbelieving world. And we will not please the unbelieving world by adopting any of their legalisms, any of their social laws that they create and attempt to foist on us in the church. And so we're reforming this one as protection against any future ones. This is what Jesus thought about those who add to his law and make other people obey them as the law of God. Matthew chapter 23. Read the whole thing. If you want your hair to start on fire, read that one. The loving Jesus says words like this. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and aneth and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Why is it that there is the church lady picture of looking down her nose and holding on to things like don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew? Why is that even a thing? It's a thing because it's not biblical and it's hypocritical and the world knows it. And in God's church, we have to acknowledge it. Yes, for the past, I have been hypocritical and used grape juice in ignorance. And now for a number of years, I've used it. Not ready to bring the church to this point. No more. There's a time we have to reform. A time we have to be brave enough to say, yes, this is right. No, this is wrong. And here's the Bible's word on it. And let the chips fall where they may. So what do we do about it now? We need to develop a biblical view of wine. If we've got a wrong one, let's get it right. Brothers and sisters, the only thing we have to do is to think God's thoughts after him. What do I mean by that? I mean, we have to adopt God's thinking as our own. As he reasons with us and shows us his way is the best way, we say, yes, Lord, your way is best. And that is what we will do, and that is how we will think. We will add nothing to it. We will take nothing away from it. That is our point of faith. The facts that God revealed. So what does God think of wine, and to whom does he attribute, attribute to its origination? You know, where did wine come from? 
It's in the bottle. How to get there? Well, it's from it. How did it get there? Well, it's from the grape. Well, where'd the grape come from? It came from a vine. Where'd the vine come from? Where's it growing? Dirt. Where'd that come from? See where I'm going. Well, Psalm 104 makes it very clear that not only in its creation, but in its manifestation as wine, God is responsible. God said it. Here it is. Psalm 104. This is a praise psalm to the works of God in creation. We are to praise him for this. Verse 14, he, God, causes the grass to grow for the cattle. Praise God, amen? He causes the vegetation for the service of man. Praise God. That he may bring forth food from the earth. Praise God. And wine that makes glad the hearts of men. No, no, wrong, error. Well, that's how we've been treating that part of Scripture, amen? I know it might be hard, but this is the truth. If grass is good, and vegetation is good, and food is good, and God says, and wine that makes glad the heart of man, then that's good too. Added to oil to make his face shine. Any of you ladies use any oil to make your face shine? I mean, I don't, but even if I did, I would admit it. And bread to strengthen man's heart. Praise the Lord. Gifts of God. We need to think of wine as a gift of God like bread, like grass, like cows and horses. You knew I'd get it in there. Ecclesiastes, the wisdom books is what we're reading from in Psalm and Ecclesiastes, verse 7. This instruction. Go, eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. Truth. Leviticus, taking from the law, the real law, God's law, the Mosaic law to Israel and what was to be done. This is a command to Israel, and it cannot be bad. Leviticus 23, 13, its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering, listen, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. How could it be that nobody's supposed to drink it, but you're supposed to pour a drink offering before the Lord, and he'll drink it? Drink offering. Should we change that word? And its drink offering shall be grape juice, one-fourth of a hen? Is that okay? If it's not okay, then we shouldn't be okay with changing what we have here when we take the Lord's table from wine to grape juice either. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out now and buy as much wine as you can drink and drink it. Already, we've had an early church pastor tell us, no tippling to the dregs. What that means exactly, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it means emptying the bottle out. So wine can be dangerous. So biblical view of wine is it's good. God gave it. God made it. We're to praise God for it. It's a blessing from God. But it, wine can be dangerous if taken without self-control, just like many other blessings. Can you eat too much bread? Could you put too much oil on your face? I'm assuming it's possible. I've seen some of those facial things, gals. I'm just saying. And what's the green one? Oh, that's sorry. You can go too far even with good things, right? You can exercise too much. Though exercise is good. Especially if it's the neglect of your spiritual exercise. Hence Paul to Timothy. You can farm and work too much to the neglect of your family. The work is prescribed. All good things can be taken too far. That doesn't mean we stop doing all of them. 
I mean, I've heard you can drink too much water and drown. It's not as common as, you know, drinking too much wine, but I'm just saying. All good things. So wine can be dangerous. Proverbs 21. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Didn't say don't drink any of it. It said don't be led astray by it, i.e. don't be controlled like Ephesians. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's about control. Is God controlling you in the Spirit, or is your flesh controlling you, and you give yourself as many scoops of ice cream as you can possibly choke down your neck? That's the difference. Proverbs 23, 31, do not look long in the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent, stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. That's true of the drunk. I am not advocating drunkenness or the misuse of the blessings of God in any way, shape, or form. I'm just saying wine should be at the Lord's table and we're going to have it there. Because wine is used also as a symbol for God's wrath and justice. Grape juice doesn't do it. The symbol that Jesus was presenting when he held up the cup and says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood was designed to lead us to the cup of wrath that God pours out on evil men to bring justice back into the world. The final sacrifice of Jesus is to bring men to God by satisfying the wrath of God against sin. And the only symbol that can hold that is wine because it is both a blessing, Jesus' blood is a blessing, but the cup which he drank of the wrath of God is a curse. The cup of wrath. Jesus said, when he went a little farther in the garden of Gethsemane and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. What cup? The cup of wrath that had been spoken about from the prophets and all the way through. And when he held up that cup of redemption in that upper room, he said, Drink of it, all of you. I took the wrath. I drank the cup. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink the cup. For he who drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Do you realize, brothers and sisters, that wine is a blessing from God, the gift of the Lord's table, and Jesus Christ symbolizing his sacrifice, that if we take it without the right heart before God, with division among us, without unity among us, and not recognizing what Jesus did in this sacrifice, we drink judgment on ourselves. Grape juice can't do that as a symbol, but wine can. Because it symbolizes the wrath of God still at work. Forget you not. God still judges even his own people. So what do we do now? We have to reform the Lord's table practices to include wine. We started with Hezekiah. The Passover had been neglected. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 1, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover of the Lord God of Israel. For the king and his leaders and all the assembly in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at the regular time. Listen, because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves nor had the people gathered together in Jerusalem. 
And the matter pleased the king and all the assembly, so they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba to Dan, that they should come and keep the Passover to the Lord of Israel at Jerusalem, since they, listen, since they had not done it for a long time in the prescribed manner. So we have not done it for a long time in the prescribed manner, but next Sunday we will begin. And we are also going to allow, for those who are not ready yet, we're going to put wine in, well, I can't remember which one it is. One will be in the center and one will be on the edge and we'll label it. We'll have wine and grape juice. Because we're going to be sensitive to others who choose not to take wine at the table by providing grape juice as well as wine. And some of you say, well, aren't they disobeying? Well, let me tell you this. Reform takes time. Changing your thinking takes time. What did he say to the Pharisees? You forgot mercy. You forgot mercy. Let none of us here be unmerciful to a brother who drinks the wine or a brother or sister who does not drink the wine, lest you be a Pharisee. For you can have the right truth and still be wrong about it. And that's exactly what they did under Hezekiah. Listen. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 18. For a multitude of the people, many from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves. Yet, listen, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. Here is mercy. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord provide atonement for everyone who prepares his heart to seek the Lord God of his fathers. See, God's going to judge your heart. Prepare it to seek the God of your fathers. Though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. Now listen and pay close attention to 2 Chronicles 30 verse 20. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. I'd like to see the Lord's table healed. I'd like to see us healed. Let me just read the last portion. So the children of Israel were present at Jerusalem, kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. <laughs> Oh, I'm not going there. I've just had to read it. So next Sunday, come with joy and gladness, for you are now part of a reformation of the Lord's table here. It will be August the 6th, 2023. It took us from 1865 to get this done. But here we are. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, we would not do anything to hurt any brother or sister here. So let mercy and love reign here in this body. Since your table is a communion, a koinonia, a fellowship of the saints in unity, let us be unified next week when we observe it. Those who take the wine are those who take the grape juice, but let our hearts be right before you. And would you have mercy on us? Mercy for not getting here fast enough, but now that we're here, Lord, May we not only observe it correctly with the right heart, but may we be vigilant to prevent the culture of the world from the outside changing your word here on the inside of your church. O oh, Master of us all, Lord Jesus, we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.